Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome back to the Nano Hub U course, Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. I'm Tim Fisher from Purdue University, and we're in the middle of week three. Uh, which is on basic thermal properties and today we're going to talk about electron specific heat. Uh, so far we've covered specific heats of phonons, acoustic and optical. And so now it's time to turn our attention to, to the electrons. We'll calculate internal energy U, capital U, uh, as the extensive property in much the same way that we did before with a couple of caveats. The first one is that uh, we have a factor of two that shows up in front because of spin degeneracy. And that comes about because electrons can have up or down spin in a given energy state. And so that's where the factor of two comes up. In many cases in dealing with electrons, you'll see a factor of two that's a little bit different than what you see for phonons. The other big difference is that uh, we use a different distribution function. So instead of the Bose-Einstein distribution function, F, we're using the Fermi-Dirac distribution function. So when we put all this together, and then we, we go back to our, our previous uh, analysis where we said most of the time we want to convert those, uh, those summations to integral form, uh, then we get the second equation here. And I'm, uh, there's a summation over P. When we were dealing with phonons, that summation was over different branches of the phonons. In this case, we're keeping it general. It could be over different bands of the electrons in case that there are any, there's some band overlap. Uh, generally speaking, we're going to drop that summation uh, because most, for most of the cases, uh, we, we won't deal with band overlap. Uh, we will, throughout this analysis, use uh, the free electron parabolic energy model. That means that the electron energy is proportional to the wave vector squared, the magnitude of the wave vector squared. And we'll use the electron mass, m sub e, although if we did this for a, a different kind of uh, electronic material, such as a semiconductor, then we would replace that with the effective mass, which is usually uh, symbolized with the m star. And again, we, we're going to deal in energy space. It's a little bit different. Most of the time with phonon analysis, we'll work in frequency space, and that's angular frequency usually. Um, and we will also use this parabolic model, and we'll, we'll start at least with, with the density of states in three dimensions. We can then use this density of states, and we multiply that by the, the distribution function and the energy and do an integral over energy space. What we're really doing in that process, by the way, is converting the k-space integral to energy space. So if we had a three-dimensional k-space, we're, we're converting it to a scalar space energy. So that's usually much easier to do, much, much easier to, to achieve closed form solutions. The other thing, if we take uh, a similar integral in this last set of equations here, but we take the energy out of it, we just integrate over the distribution function multiplied by the density of states, then we'll get the electron number density, which will show up in many of our calculations later. Um, and in fact, that electron number density can be made very easily, can be calculated very easily because the electron number doesn't change. And because of that, we could assume that we were, if we just wanted to count electrons, we could take it a zero Kelvin case, in which case the Fermi Dirac function is just a step for a step function, a downward step function. And that just means that the, uh, the integral that we show here uh, from zero to infinity in the first equality can be converted to an integral from zero to the Fermi energy, that's E sub F, and that integrand then is only the density of states because the distribution function is one or zero, and it's one for energies between zero and the Fermi energy, and it's zero for any energies higher than that. Now one thing we're going to do in this, in the derivation, we're, remember we're after the, the specific heat or specific heat capacity, we're going to do a little bit of a digression here for a mathematical convenience, and it won't be so obvious why we're doing it until the end, um, and hopefully then it will be, but who knows. Uh, but we're going to define a new internal energy, so instead of saying this, this internal energy U sub E, we're going to subtract the, uh, the Fermi energy multiplied by that electron density from it. And if we look at this, 
we go through the calculations. We actually see from the previous uh, slide we showed the integral for the electron density. We then can express the integrand for the most part in terms of an energy difference between uh, the electron energy and the Fermi energy, because that's that electron di or that energy difference shows up also in the distribution function. Now it's not necessarily there in the density of states, and we're going to take care of that in a moment. But one of the things we'll notice is that if we were to take a temperature derivative of this internal energy, then it would be the same. The temperature derivative of this new internal energy U star would be the same, because the only term that depends on temperature is the Fermi Dirac distribution function. As, and as we showed uh, in the last slide, the, the electron density can be expressed independently of that, of that factor. So we go ahead and calculate this. We express the specific heat. This is the electronic specific heat in the form shown here. And what we're going to do, the, the, I, I mentioned earlier that we can pull the density of states out of the integral. The reason we can do that is that the Fermi function really only changes very much right near the Fermi energy. Everywhere else it's either one or zero, very, very much or very close to a constant. Um, and so what we do, and this, this is something that, that is done quite often in electronic transport problems, is we say, well, we're going to actually take that density of states and evaluate it at the energy where this distribution function or this other term in the integrand is changing a lot. And we'll pull that out of the integral entirely. And then what we're left with inside the integral are terms that depend only on the difference between the electron energy and the Fermi energy, because that difference shows up is the only thing that shows up in, in the Fermi Dirac distribution function as well. And once we do that, then we finally get this equation that's shown on the right here, where this, where we've non-dimensionalized uh, an energy. Uh, in this case, the, that factor x is E minus, so that's the electron energy minus the Fermi energy, and all of that is normalized by the thermal energy KBT. Okay, so we can evaluate that integral. Uh, if, we, if we start out with the assumption that uh, the Fermi energy is much, much bigger than the thermal energy, and that's almost always true, because remember, the Fermi energies are usually three, four, five, maybe more electron volts, whereas thermal energy is only you know, 20 milli electron volts, 25 milli electron volts at room temperature. So if we make that assumption, we'll change that lower bound of the previous integral to minus infinity, and that allows for an analytic evaluation of the specific heat. And what we find, very interestingly, is that the specific heat, the electronic specific heat, is proportional to temperature to the power one. So, so it's directly proportional to temperature. And then the, everything else in this equation is a constant of sorts. Of course, of course, we have Boltzmann's constant, but also the density of states now you, normally, when we talk about density of states, it's, a, it's a, a variable that depends on energy. In this case, it's the density of states evaluated at the Fermi energy. So that's very, a, a very important point that is sometimes missed uh, when students start to do these calculations. The other thing that we can do is to express this not in terms of the Fermi energy, but rather in terms of that factor that we introduced at the beginning of the lecture, that is the electron density, that's eta sub e. And so then we, the, the second row of equations here um, makes those calculations. Again, it's proportional to temperature, and now this collection of constants includes the, the electron density. So we can combine this. We have a specific heat, an electron-specific heat, that's l proportional to t to the power 1, so linear in temperature. And then for three-dimensional materials, we had a t cubed dependence for low temperatures. Those were b much below the Debye temperature for phonons, the T cubed comes from the phonon part, or for very high temperatures, temperatures much larger than the Debye temperature, uh, we had a constant term. So if you had a material, say a metal, it could store heat, that's what heat capacity tells you, uh, the, the ability of a material to store heat. Um, the, and if you saw, or if you were able to measure a temperature dependence and kind of knew what the what temperature regime you were in, you could you could calculate these constants a and b um, that are showing up here, and that's really what these kind of of calculations are good for, especially for the electrons. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments about 
what we've done here, which, which is really free electron theory. It, it, there are a number of failures that have nothing to do with, with uh, thermal things, but I, I've included some of them here. Um, it poorly predicts magnetic properties, some thermal uh, properties and other directional properties. It, it, the magnitudes of specific heat predicted by this theory are generally off, but the temperature dependence is, is quite good. So if you see a linear temperature dependence in a specific heat, it's either because the high temperature, it's at, at a high temperature relative to the Debye temperature for phonons, which means that their contributions is a, are constant, or that the electronic part just dominates over the phonon parts in the first place. Um, and and the, another big failure of the free electron theory is that it really doesn't not, does not explain why some materials are insulators, and you know that's a, a major concern for electrical engineers for for what we do for um, in thermal engineering. Most of the time, we'll say if it's not a, a metal, if it's not a highly electrically conductive material, then the electronic parts of the transport properties are, are essentially negligible, and we'll just focus and. The, in those cases, we focus on the phonon parts. In fact, there are some materials that are metals, formally metals, meaning that they have a, a non-zero density of states at the Fermi energy, um, and their electronic contributions to heat flow are much less than those of phonons anyway. So um, carbon nanotubes are a good example of that. Even though they're metallic, some of them are. The ones that are metallic, even so, there's not a high enough electron density to make the magnitude of heat flow from electrons comparable to that by phonons. So we'll, we'll cover a, a few of these things. We still have to add some other concepts like scattering to really bring all of these things together, and, and we'll get there soon enough. Uh, that'll be at least part of the topic for the next lecture. Thanks.